Friends, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May it be yours now and forever. Amen. We are at a moment, sisters and brothers, a moment of change, a moment of growth. We're on the cusp, wondering what God is going to do next among us. When he says words like this, you are the salt of the earth. The salt loses its saltiness. How can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled. You are the light of the world, a city on a hill that can't be hidden. God has a vision for us that is not a got-to vision, but a get-to vision. And I'm wondering whether or not it's something that's come close to your heart. You know, sometimes we, as in the Old Testament lesson, when people were complaining, we're doing this fast, we're doing this, we're doing that, and God doesn't seem to be listening to us. And, and, and the prophet Isaiah goes through and says, okay, here's why God's not listening to you. Because you're acting dopey. You say you're, you're, you're doing this fast, and you're, and you're acting in other ways. You say that you're, you're going through all the religious motions, but it hasn't come close to your heart. And the clearest indication of that is you're not feeding the poor. You're not taking care of the, those who are oppressed. You know, this, this action that you're going through is not changing anything in you. It's kind of like that old story. For some of you, it'll be a new story uh, of the, the woman whose sister was teaching her about how to cook a roast. They said, well, of course, when you cook the roast, you take a half inch off of this end and a half inch off of that end. And she said, well, why are we doing that? I said, well, I, I don't know. I'm supposed, I suppose it's because, you know, this has been exposed to air and this is, you know, for the juices and everything. And, well, you better ask mom. And so they go and ask mom. And she says, well, I suppose it's because this has been exposed to air and, and the juices are there. But you better ask grandma. And grandma says, well, I suppose that th there must be some, like you're exposed to air and you're, we're trying to seal in the juices. Let's ask great grandma. And you go to great grandma and she says, well, when I was first learning how to cook, I had a nine-inch pan. <laughs> and that's why we're doing Friends, do you even know why you're doing some of the things that you're doing? And in fact, perhaps, are, are, we, are we the villagers in the story of the big red tractor and the little village, Tim? The big red tractor and the little village. Once upon a time in a little field, in a happy little village lived a big red tractor. Every morning during plowing season, the village people, no, not those village people, would come out and start the red tractor. Everyone loved the tractor and the powerful noises it would make. They would cheer for the big red tractor because he would help them through plowing season. The people worked together to move the tractor. Half of the villagers would push from behind while the other half would pull. They had been doing it this way for many generations. Some days they moved the tractor 10 feet. Some days they moved it 20. They did this for three whole months every year. Because of their hard work, the villagers always managed to plow the field just in time to plant and just before the rainy season. The rains would come to water the field then the sun would come out to make the crops grow. And then the people would come out and harvest all the new crops. It was just enough food to feed the entire village. One day, Farmer Dave was cleaning out his attic. To his surprise, he found an old book tucked beneath his great-grandpa's belongings. It was the owner's manual to the big red tractor. This book told about how the tractor was made and all of the great things it could do. Farmer Dave studied the book all night. He was shocked by what he was reading. According to the book, if the big red tractor was running properly, it could plow the whole field in just one day. Early the next morning, Farmer Dave gathered the villagers to tell them the good news. But nobody believed him. There's no way that tractor can move on its own, some said. One lady said, it sounds like you're reading a fairy tale. The people laughed at him. This made Farmer Dave very sad. This didn't stop Farmer Dave from believing what he read. 
Every night, while the other villagers were asleep, Farmer Dave spent time repairing the big red tractor. One night, Farmer Dave fixed the tractor completely. He jumped on the tractor and had so much fun driving it, he ended up plowing the whole field in one night. The next morning, the villagers woke up and were in shock. The whole field had been plowed. It's a miracle, one man said. Maybe aliens came down, said an old woman. No, look over there, a little boy shouted. It was Farmer Dave sleeping on the tractor. It was then that people shouted, He was right, the tractor book is true. The villagers ended up plowing many fields that year and harvesting way more food than they could ever eat. They had so many leftover boxes of food that they began taking the boxes to other villages where food was scarce. The big red tractor and his little village soon became famous throughout the land. They became known as the most generous and life-giving people in the whole wide world. So friends, how many tractors you been pushing? You know? God has provided every bit of power we need to be, if he claims that we are the salt of the earth, then he's given power for us to be the salt of the earth. If he claims that we are the light of the world, then his light shows through us because on our own, you and I, we're darkness. But God has given us this beautiful gift. In Isaiah, it's kind of described more clearly what a fast day is supposed to be like. It says, is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer shelter? And when you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away your own flesh and blood, then your light, it says, will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. In other words, as we do this, God works through us. And God even works through us to even want to do this. Pastor Loza was supposed to be here. He's, he's uh, because of a medical issue, he's not able to be preaching this morning, but he sent a video that I want to make sure you get a chance to see because this is our light shining. Tim, would you run that, please? Uh, see, Matthew has been organized by German immigrants uh, about 133 years ago. And when I took over, uh, I had to have two services, one in English for a congregation that was made up uh, mostly by German Americans, most of them in their 70s and 80s. And the second service had to be in Spanish for the uh, people who lived there who were mostly uh, Mexican. The soup kitchen has become to us a place where we do not feed the body of the homeless and employed only, but also we feed the spirit of the person because before the meals are served, uh, we have uh, devotional services, a uh, short one, where the, the scriptures are read, um, prayers are said, and, uh, and a small uh, meditation, some sort of a sermon is also said. Uh, this gives us the satisfaction that we are not only feeding these people who are hungry, uh, but also we are providing to them an understanding of our faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, we provide to them uh, a knowledge of what's written in the scriptures in terms of God's love and love's compassion for everyone. Uh, I, I must say that the, the main reason we felt that we had to have a soup kitchen is because of the teachings of Jesus Christ. Uh, in the gospel, especially in the gospel of St. Matthew, we find Jesus Christ 
uh, feeding the 5,000 with the fish and the bread. Uh, we find him advocating to help the hungry, the, the poor. And uh, those uh, words have impacted in this situation where we were at. And we thought that those words would be maybe the, the main reason why we would justify a soup kitchen in that area. Uh, the soup kitchen is not limited to a ethnic group. Because we are a ministry that gears towards uh, Hispanics, uh, doesn't mean that we only provide the food for Hispanics, but also uh, uh, the the people who come to our place are are people who come from different ethnic backgrounds. The Americans who are black, we have European Americans, uh, Polish people, Italian. Uh, we even have German Americans coming in. One of them is a lady who now has joined the uh, St. Matthew Lutheran Church because she says that she was German from way back, but she came to us through the soup kitchen. Uh, this gives us a greater satisfaction because we believe that uh, the mission of the Lord uh, should not be, uh, and it's not expected to be just geared to one kind of people, one kind of race or nationality. Uh, also, I want to mention one, something that very seldom is mentioned, is that I have found out that some of the people who come to eat with us, that meal they receive at noon, uh, which is cooked in, in, a, in a wonderful way by, by the ladies who are led by a professional cook, uh, that meal might be the only meal they're going to have all day long. Uh, our Lutheran churches in Illinois uh, sending uh, their members to have the experience to be in a soup kitchen and, how, and, and see how it, how, how it works. Uh, I think most of them, I would say, they have really been, uh, they enjoyed it, uh, they, and I think they felt the impact of the meaning of love and compassion to us, the poor for the first time in their lives. They have seen these people, the kind of people who come in. And um, uh, I think they have helped us, but also they have benefited with an experience that they couldn't find anywhere else because we, we in our pulpit, we talk about the poor, the hungry, uh, and everything else but uh, our members are very seldom exposed to the reality of those people who actually exist, and they have to go to a soup kitchen to be fed. It, it's a good experience for both of us, uh, because we who have started this program, we feel less uh, isolated from the rest of the Lutherans. We feel that uh, some of our fellow Lutherans uh, care enough to come to visit us and help us out. Uh, now the financial part, I, I, I can't deny, is the most important part of the help we can get uh, for the f because of the fact that we are a self-supported entity. We have no grants, no government grants or for any grant. And uh, we've been working that way for 26 uh, years. And that's why our newsletter shows that at the beginning says, uh, St. Matthew's journey continues on. You know, St. Matthew's journey continues on because of people like you and me who continue to support. Remember all of that soup we had out here? That's where that went. And we have 85 members of our congregation who are going down and making sure that the poor are fed. This is... This is not the sum of the faith, but it's part of the faith. It's not the totality to do just a social gospel, if you will, but let us not go through the rote of our religious lives without the Spirit of God empowering us for the harvest, His harvest in His way, and it starts with our hearts. Will you pray with me? Oh, Lord God, 
open my heart so I take a good look at the owner's manual. Help me remember why I'm here. Empower me. Do things through me that are greater than I could ever do. And show forth the light of your love in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, two things. Thing number one, next week I wouldn't miss church. Because next week I'm, I've got an announcement to make that, that you're going to, to see what the light of God's love through us does in folks outside of us. It's a big announcement. It's a confession on the part of your pastor. You'll hear me uh, con uh, confess and you'll hear what God has done in response uh, to, to that. That's thing number one. Thing number two, I want to give you a challenge. Today, when you receive the blessing, you know, what you've received, you pass on, right? Because none of us, you don't receive it and hold it unto ourselves. Wouldn't it be just what? And you don't have to do this. This is not a got to. This is a get to. Wouldn't it be marvelous if you just put the hand in the person in the pew in front of you or behind you, put your hand on their shoulder, and you said, God bless you this week and always. Wouldn't that be cool if, if we became a congregation so engaged with one another that we were able to receive the blessing and pass it on to folks who are right here? Let's receive that blessing. Please rise. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.